Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Alamiri. So uh, we're going to talk about the um, uh, a therapeutic uh, paradigm uh, based on ALL for, uh, for based on CAR T cells for ALL. I have uh, many um, uh, conflicts, but none of them are relevant to today's talk. Um, so let's talk about uh, refractory ALL, because I assume most of us are clinicians in this room. Um, so it's refractory disease, as you know, failure to obtain CR induction, uh, failure to eradicate all the de detectable leukemia cells, and subsequent restoration of hematopoiesis and relapses, re reappearance of leukemia cells. But newer definitions are appearing now based on PCRs and MRD for actual definition. And you will see a lot more change of the definition of ALL. Because today my talk is focused on relapsed acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Unless otherwise mentioned, it's going to focus on B cell precur or precursor B cell ALL rather than T cell. So the relapse of refractory uh, ALL in adults is a bad disease. Um, there's a slight difference in the, the outcome uh, of uh, ALL in pediatrics and adults. So today's talk is mainly on adult ALL. Uh, as you know, that this is one of the original papers in, by Fielding et al. Um, and colleagues um, based on the American and the, uh, the MRC study. Uh, majority of the uh, adults diagnosed with ALL will eventually relapse after initial CR. And about a quarter will have resistant disease. And uh, a lot of them will die in long-term follow-up. Things have changed. This is 2007, based on 2000 uh, da data from before 2000 as well as up to 2005. Or so. Uh, so, uh, but so significantly hasn't changed. When I focus on CAR T cells, um, I'm going to actually focus on an area where, which I think is extremely important as quality of life and patient reported outcomes. So I'm, I'm going to ask the audience to predict the graphs or think about the graphs of survival or numbers based on what, how a patient thinks rather than how physicians think. Because Jerry Groupman's uh, book of how doctors think actually is alarming to indicate that actually how we get tunnel vision and focus on numbers rather than patients. And the other book actually written a long time ago by La Fontaine um, it really summarizes how actually patients are feeling. And that's what we need to incorporate in any trial that we do, anything we talk about today. Uh, whether it's ALL, myeloma, lymphoma, leukemia, sickle cell, gene therapy, CAR T cells. Um, and, and think about like physicians when we're thinking of OS and PS, great. MRD negativity, look at the PET scans. But at the end of the day, a patient is asking, I'm going to get, get cured, symptom management, uh, am I going to get better or not? Is my child going to get better or not? So let's focus on those questions every time we're looking at a graph. So the common treatments include uh, cytotoxic chemotherapies for relapse of uh, ALL, bleonitumab or INO, transplant, CAR T cells, palliation with supportive care only, like corticosteroids or corticosteroids for plus vincristine, uh, or a combination of above. But what sequence, if, if, if some of them are uh, available to, for treatment, and post-transplant relapse, if the treatment's different? None of the above as well. I mean, and, and all of the above or, or uh, various combinations. So that's the question. Now, this is the last uh, NCCN guideline paper uh, for the insurance companies for approval of therapies. Obviously, they don't say this is the best or the second best, but they just give you throw a kitchen sink on you that, uh, you know, these treatments are available. So I want you to focus on, on uh, look at the pH negative ALL. I mean, you have clinical trial. It should be the first uh, uh, preference. And we should try our level best to get clinical trials. And that's how it makes, um, that's how we make progress. But in the absence of that, I know Blina or Tizagen, which is a CAR T cell, or a cytotoxic chemotherapy, there are four options in the people who are not entirely comfort care. So think about these four options and keep those in mind as we go through. Uh, classic chemotherapies are many. This is tip of the iceberg, by the way. In different countries, it's treated differently, in fact. In Kenya, things are different. In India, things are different. In Japan, things are different. But it could be cytotherapy-based regimens, which are the most common, by the way. Clofarabine, Mopad, I'm going from down to up, lipo uh, liposomal wind, Christine, R3 protocols, uh, FLAM, FLAGIDA, augmented hypersevad, hypersevad, with or without rituxan, by the way. You can add rituxan to all of these, or none of these, in fact. So this is uh, just a general spectrum of some of them. But uh, let's look at the classic chemotherapies. This was RSC plus one dose of uh, IDA, and indicating that there were uh, 11 CRs and one treatment-related death. Again, the, as most, most of the studies, there's no quality of life. So either you look at the overall survival, you look at the CR rates. CR rates are 
So classic chemotherapy, one third of the people get a CR. What do you do next? Typically, in a, in a young fit patient, allogeneic transplant. So let's take a look at the TAVO trial published about three years ago, 400 patients. It was a blind, it was a randomized study uh, based on cytarabine uh, chemotherapies versus blina, and about a quarter went to transplant. The median OS, the first number of 7.7 .7 is, uh, is uh, the blinitumab versus four months, so statistically significant. That's great news, that's a win-win. You met the primary endpoint, you're a winner. But to a patient and his son, tell him that at the end of three years, everybody is gonna die majority are going to die, but there's a three-month difference in survival initially. That doesn't sound great. That certainly doesn't sound great. The CR is 34 percent versus 16 percent. It's clearly a winner. I don't need to give you a p-value here. Six-month EFS was different. Six-month OS was slightly different. There was a 15-point difference in six-month survival. And side effects were significantly higher in the blinatumumab trial. So you have a safety versus survival issue. And this is the, uh, the actual graphs. As you can see, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the pointer is not working here. So let me just, I don't know. Uh, I don't have a mouse here. But uh, if you see the top graph of survival, how many people are alive at 24, year, 24 months? Not many, in fact. At the end of the day, at two years. And what about five years? Not many are alive. So if you're a young patient, you're going to tell this that it's a wonder drug. Five years, not going to, it doesn't matter to a lot of people when you think like a patient. Uh, let's look at the ENO trial. It was, again, a positive trial, so-called positive trial. is statistically significant where a key opinion leader is on the stage of ASH or, or, or TCT or EHA and just astoundingly showing you the p-values and confidence intervals that we met the primary endpoint. It's a great study. But if you look at the actual median overall survival of one month difference, I mean, honestly speaking, if you were a patient, how would you, how would you feel, actually, that this, this combination gives you one month extra survival? Well, in fact, the answer, they very rightly so in the paper that this is a bridge to transplant, not the definitive therapy. Well, certainly it doesn't sound like a blockbuster here based on numbers to a patient. To a physician, yes. So that's the difference between thinking like a patient or thinking like a clinician. And that's why we have to keep on start thinking like a patient. If I were a patient, how would we feel? This is a, this is a graph, actually. And if, at 40 months, uh, many, many people have actually died at the end of the day. So let's just change gears to CAR T cells, keeping in mind the same phenomena that you have to think like a patient and be on the patient's side and be a true patient advocate that think every kid who comes in, 15-year-old, is your son. So uh, the CD19 CAR is uh, the, the, the famous trial from CHOP, 30 children, adults, primary refractory disease with 10 percent, 60 percent was post-transplant relapses. Well, the, the CR rates were phenomenal, 90 percent. We have not seen those kind of CR rates, actually, with the cytotoxic chemotherapies, immunotherapies, bites, uh, or different kind of uh, immunotherapies. And the six-month EFS uh, was, was uh, 67 percent, OS was 78 percent, which is phenomenal. In fact, CRS was a problem, about one-third of the people. Uh, a lot of people ended up in the ICU. And this is uh, Shannon Maud's uh, paper in New England Journal in 2014. I'm going to show you the 2017 Jay Parks paper after this one. But this actually, if you can see the six-month survival, you see only one bar at the top, um, uh, the dark one, because this is a single-arm study. So there's no randomized trial, by the way, uh, at the moment published for any CAR T cells for any disease, period, let alone ALL, in fact, as far as published data is concerned. So the, um, uh, this is a month since infusion, so actually you're seeing the plateau that's m making an effect. So it, it's really making a difference in the patient, in the survival as far as that's concerned. But long-term survival we don't have, in fact. The, this is uh, another study, the single-arm study. This is um, CD1928 uh, CAR-T construct, C again CD19 again. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the basics of CAR-T cells because in the morning you had many talks uh, by Dr. Rafiq and others on the basics of CAR-Ts and constructs and vectors and, uh, uh, and, and different type of uh, first generation, second generation, third generation CARs and second generation CAR have uh, been tested the most. Um, the CR was 83%, uh, again way above the one-third and the EFS was 13 months. 
at a 29 month follow up and survival was 13 months. So uh, certainly overall survival uh, of 13 months doesn't sound great, but certainly much better than any therapies as far as historical con uh, controls are concerned. Nine patients with MRD positive had uh, CAR T, um, um, uh, after CAR T had a relapse, CD19 escape we call and uh, CRS was 85%. Severe neuro neurological toxicity was 42%. So that's the bottom. That's important to know. So we have to improve that one patient died of multi-organ failure. So Jay Park was going to be here. In fact, he couldn't come. Um, so this is uh, his uh, paper in New England Journal a couple, of year, uh, a couple of years ago. And as you can see, the high burden disease folks did not do well, even with the CAR T cells. In fact, and, and those, one, those of who are MRD positive after CAR T cells, uh, they don't do well. And in this study, in fact, they didn't do well after allotransplant either, by the way. So it just tells you that the high disease burden of ALL is a bad disease. At the moment, we don't have a superstar magic drug for 99% of the people. We don't have a imatinib for these people. So um, this is uh, Jay Park's paper again, showing excellent results of overall survival. As you can see, the top uh, right, uh, sorry, top left on your side, uh, curve uh, going all the way to, 40, uh, to, to 60 months, in fact, showing the plateau, which is continuing, not dropping off steeply. So then a lot of questions arise. When do we use CAR T cells before transplant, after transplant? Uh, GVHD, no GVHD. Should we vaccinate these people? Should we do Belina or I know before transplant? Should we do cytotoxic chemotherapy before transplant? How long the GVHD drugs should be off? So we started the international panel meeting at ASH three years ago, in fact, and then we met again at the TCT at that time and then EBMT. And we got all the people from FACT and JC, and we got all the people from EBMT leadership, including the president at that time, Mohammed Moti, and other folks in many countries, in fact, uh, from, uh, from uh, Germany to Israel to uh, France and, and many other countries together. Uh, all the CAR-T experts and, and, and indicated that, you know, we got to make guidelines for the practicing clinicians. Most of you are not doing CAR-T cells day and night. So you need guidance actually when to use them, how to sequence them. So we actually did the top 10 question, uh, common questions that hematologists in practice will ask and people will ask how to treat people with CAR-T cells in ALL. Subsequently, we did the lymphoma paper, and then uh, with IMWG, hopefully we're going to have a myeloma paper, and this week I've been very busy with the long-term follow-up paper for CAR T cells from ASTCT and EBMT contacting Peter McCallum in Australia and Japan and Korea and, and Singapore and other centers. So we're coming up with these papers for clinicians to know actually how to use the CAR T cells, when to use them. So um, this was the task force from ISCT as well. Kathy Bullard was there and many other folks in JC. We wanted to be all inclusive, and we still want to be all inclusive because it's actually uh, doesn't seem wise to consider CAR T cells for 11% of the world, which is U the population of US and your EU combined, and rest of the 89% of the world has no role at all although they want to do it. So how do we make things better, in fact? And this is one of the ideas, actually, in the long term, how to make cars better, in fact, uh, whether it be allogeneic carpools or whether it be something else. Well, just so I'm just going to go over a few slides and then uh, uh, call it off because we have next phenomenal speakers, much better than I, uh, talking about car, uh, different cars for different diseases. But uh, FDA approved an indication for Kimraya for Tizagen was only for people below 26. This was in August 2017. And in June 2018, remember, the EMA approved the Kimraya as well uh, in, in Euro for Europe as well for second or greater. Uh, bone marrow exponentially relapse, refractory disease as well, after initial diagnosis of first relapse of 25 or less than 25-year-old people. Uh, and referral to CAR therapy center was very important, actually. When do you refer the patient? Well, the answer is when they have primary induction failure, early, re early relapse after achieving first CR. Adult patients with relapse and refractory B-cell ALL don't wait for multiple relapses because by, by that time, the burden of CARs is very, burden of disease is very high. And I showed you Jay Park's paper, it doesn't actually help too much if the burden is extremely high. So you have to refer early. In the, in the U.S., uh, most of the centers, there are, two, there are 300 transplant centers who do stem cell transplants, and, major, and, 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 and about 50 of them are very big academic centers which do CAR T cells. It's under REMS program, the risk mitigation strategies by FDA. So, um, so actually, you have to refer to a center which does CAR T cells and bone marrow transplant because I'm going to show you why. Because at this moment in 2020, 
the jury is still out that whether allogeneic stem cell transplant is absolutely necessary after a car in ALL or not. And you will see opposing views from different people. I mean, you go to CHOP and certain other places where some real good constructs of cars are showing very long-term remissions, and that's a wonderful data. But some other centers, depending on the car and the vector and the generation and the follow-up and the disease burden itself, it's actually different data. So you have to refer to a transplant center and a car center, which fortunately are the same in most of the countries at the moment. This may change in the future. People are saying we can do cars and we don't need to be allotransplanters, which I'm biased, I think is not fair. But, uh, but that's the way it is currently. Refractory disease was defined in Ileana trial from Penn that I showed you. Uh, and, and Steve Grupp actually updated that trial uh, results in 2018 ASH. Uh, it's not achieving CR after two cycles of standard chemotherapy or chemo refractory is not achieving CR after one cycle of standard chemo. So and then we actually gave a guidance of when to stop different therapies before, trans uh, before giving CAR T cells. For be and before you, this is autologous CARs, remember Kimraya? I mean, your own cells, you do leukophoresis, in fact, after giving flu sci and cytoxin, and, and the, that trial was about a gram, 522 days, and fl fludarabine was, uh, was 120 milligrams per meter square. So you've got to stop the angiogenic cell therapies about 12 weeks before, before doing leukophoresis, not before giving CARs, before actual procedure. And, and about two months before, you've got to stop all the T-cell lytic agents, in fact. And the DLIs, if you have escalated DLI or, or scheduled DLI, you've got to stop that about a month, uh, at least a month before giving, uh, doing the apheresis. Now, GVHD therapies, immunomodulatory drugs, lenalidomide maintenance, for example, is an immunomodulatory drug. You've got to stop that, actually, a couple of weeks before you do leukophoresis. And um, CNS-directed therapies, don't do that right away. Just one day before you're doing CNS prophylaxis for ALL, not a good idea at all. In fact, short-acting growth factors, stop them five days before insider toxic chemotherapy and systemic steroids, definitely stop them three days. So you can't give a whole load of CAR T cells at, 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 and at the same time you're doing high-dose corticosteroids. That's not going to work, in fact. So the, we, give, we give some guidance, actually. Um, and then this is a, a pictorial diagram in a table form about when to stop, when not to stop. But these are the common agents, uh, brincristine, 6-MP, thioguanine. Uh, as well as PEG aspergenase. There's a lot of questions. We had a lot of debates because, as you can see, there were like 30, 40 authors from all around the world, and many questions came up with PEG aspergenase and uh, any T cell antibodies as well. Uh, but this is a general, obviously, it doesn't apply to all patients, a general guidance for the uh, practitioner uh, because, in the real world, when you refer to the CAR center, a lot of therapies are still going on or are scheduled or they come back. It's not like bone marrow transplant that you can just refer and forget about it. Actually, you're doing some therapies as well, and you're responsible because the CAR centers are very few in the world. So if there's going to be one CAR center in Riyadh, and people are going to be referred from all over. Clinicians need to know this, when to stop therapy before referring the patient or at the time of referral of the patient. And uh, this is uh, very important, actually. This is one of the T-shirts I wear, in fact, uh, of uh, no GVHD when I'm running. This is, uh, if you have active graft versus host disease, do not even do leukophoresis. You gotta, you gotta treat that first, in fact. Forget about CARS. If they have a relapse at the same time, then you have to treat this first. And if patients on triple immunosuppressants, you know it, it ain't gonna work. You gotta get rid of that, because that's a bigger problem and more immediate threat at the moment uh, for quality of life as well as uh, survival. So do not, I mean, assess the graft versus host disease very well. And, and I do the GVHG clinic, and we know that when the isinophilia is increasing, doubling, tripling, in fact, in chronic GVHD, and then a dry mouth is getting worse and worse and worse, I'm not gonna refer that patient for CAR-T therapy because I know it's, it's gonna, GVHD is gonna come, so you need to have a very, very good suspicion of GVHD that it may relapse. I mean, I think of GVHD as myeloma, by the way. I mean, you've got you to treat it effectively, but you've got to prevent it after treatment. So um, majority will respond after four weeks, but this is based on Kimraya uh, data. We have many more cars actually approved. I'm not saying CAR T cells because we have many more car, uh, different type of cars actually, from armored cars to NK cars to many million other cat cars. Um, so 
but if they don't respond within actually a month or even a couple of months and MRD is positive, I don't think they're going to respond at all. I mean, you've got to do MRD analysis. We had a whole section of this in the paper, flow cytometry. Uh, you need to get the lab involved, and the NGS flow cytometry should be ready before you do CAR T cells. And biopsy bone marrow you have to do in, uh, every three months for the first year. So that's important to know. Important to tell the patient, in fact. So how do you manage uh, basal uh, hypogammic globinemia? I'm not going to go over this because we have two more papers published after this paper is published. Published, and many other groups are publishing how to treat hypogammic globinemia for how long uh, and what are the uh, instances and the cutoffs. In fact, you see a paper on cutoff of I IgG levels as well. So, uh, but we had, a, we, had, uh, we, have, uh, we had 51 proposals this year to CIBM TR CAR T committee, out of which uh, they merged and there were only 11 proposals left. And uh, one of the proposals, few proposals I was on for the CAR T cells, uh, and this was uh, to look at this B-cell uh, uh, therapy um, of the IVIG. But the long-term management, this is my, one of my last slides, you don't know actually when you start treatment with something new in the world. I mean, we predicted car, the cords are going to go up and up and up in the world and see what happened after three decades of cords. It's gone down, actually. We cannot predict what happens to Jesse Geisinger. Geisinger in Philly when we started the first gene therapy in the world, actually, and he died. Well, there was many other reasons um, in Penn, but, uh, but nonetheless, a 15-year follow-up is mandated by U.S. You, see, you, see, you hear this word, devil is in the details? Well, what follow-up is needed and how? How are you going to make that happen? I mean, you have a survivorship clinic. No. You're going you're gonna to monitor the, for the colon cancer, liver cancer, skin cancer? No. So how are you going to do CAR T cells without having long-term follow-up? I mean, doing things are easy. Having a child born is very hard. But what happens for the next 20 years for the child and what you do with your child is, is another important question. So ideally, it should be follow-up in survivorship clinic, neuropsychiatric evaluations. Mirav Bar just published on late neurotoxicity, astounding data and surprising data that they had persistence of neuropsychiatric problem proportion, proportion of people even two years or three years post getting CAR T infusions. For evaluation of subsequent malignancies would require SOPs. This is a critical part, and that's the paper we're making, actually, official guideline paper for the whole world. And why are we making that? It's because of medical tourism. How many of you have patients who went to U.S. to CHOP or to uh, Houston or Dela Faba or many other places for CAR T cells? Many of you have. From all over the world, in fact. Or went to Germany or as well. I mean, very few say, but majority go to Philadelphia um, or Mayo Clinic or, or MD Anderson. But what happens to them when they come back? Who's going to follow up these people? Who knows the long-term toxicity of cars? So the message today and what I'm very vocal in saying that at ASTCT, I had a presentation um, back in Orlando last week, and, and many of the folks are saying that you have to follow these people. You can't do an ideal world in U.S. because these patients are not in U.S. From Egypt, from Saudi Arabia, from India, all, all the rich people or the government uh, Fords actually sends these people from Malaysia, China, for CAR T cells there. China, many centers are doing it, much more than U.S., but uh, the rich people are still going to U.S. So, so I'm almost done. This is the future, Effi efficiency. I'm not going to talk about the detail, but efficiency of the car and car constructs and the vector and all these things. Um, there, there are South Kandarian here and many other world gurus here. I'm not going to talk about that, but effectiveness has to increase. Expansion, long-term expansion has to increase. But, and there's a lot of things that can compromise the long-term expansion, not just the construct itself, in fact. Cost effectiveness must be evaluated. We see many papers in that, but no good paper that tells you about developing countries. In fact, clinical trials comparing other modalities, sugar and lymphoma, we have three trials starting for randomized uh, CAR versus non-CAR, transplant. And it's going to be take a few years for that to be published. Today, we have single-arm trials, single-arm only published for CAR T cells, GVHT medication strategies. As you know, alpha-beta depleted CAR T therapy trials have started already. Fortunately, and you know, the NKSL trial by Katie Rizvani, our group, is already published, in fact, showing 13 patients with no graft-versus-host disease, in fact. Wonderful trial, in fact, and that has to be in many other groups. Karolinska group is doing that study as well. So patient reported outcomes must be assessed via validated quality of life scales. If you don't have PROM, then I'm going to reject every study that's going to come to me for, uh, for CAR T cells because you need to have quality of life assessments, if, especially if it's not a randomized trial. You need to see how the patients are feeling, and that needs to be captured from patients, not from physician-reported outcomes, in fact. And that's because that's where my survivorship thing comes in, that you need to think about a patient. 
With that, I'm going to end on time. Um, I have many acknowledgments that I cannot fill in many screens, in fact, but I'm very thankful to my bone marrow transplant, the, the, one of the most wonderful group at King Faisal Hospital, um, all the 14 consultants and pediatric group as well, as well as Mayo Clinic bone marrow transplant team, the HTCT leadership, ISCT leadership, uh, NIH uh, late effects panel that we made with Steve Pavlitek, fact leadership as well, uh, patients, patients, caregivers. And I, I, see, I show this picture in most of my talks. One of my greatest inspirations, which is an acknowledgement, is Edon Thomas, who has passed away. But this guy actually has changed many things in the world because of 40 million donors in unrelated registries. So thanks to Anthony Nolan and his mom for starting this unrelated donor registry. Thank you, everybody.